Welcome to GBC Health Expert Connections. We provide these calls as an opportunity to connect our members with big ideas as well as business leaders, scholars, and innovators in the global health arena. We hope that you continue to find these calls informative and inspiring as we work together to create a healthier world. Every day, some 500 women and girls die from childbirth and pregnancy in areas affected by or prone to conflict or national, natural disaster. In these settings, women and girls are often cut off from health care and exposed to trauma, disease, and violence. The provision of food and drinking water, shelter, and basic medical care remain top priorities. However, sexual and reproductive health tools and services are often overlooked. With a focus on UNFPA's program to support pregnant women and children living in crises situations, um, through the Safe Birth Even Here campaign, we aim to spend the next hour examining the unique role and specific entry points for private sector in supporting sustained access to quality sexual and reproductive health care and services in these emergency settings. This morning, we are thrilled to have representatives from the United Nations Population Fund, Johnson & Johnson, GE Healthcare, and Zonta International as we discuss how private sector expertise, networks, and resources can improve health outcomes for women and girls. Our first speaker, Dr. Henia Dukak, is a medical doctor, a public health specialist, and a past Fulbright postdoctorate research scholar. A senior technical advisor with the Humanitarian Response Branch at the UN Population Fund, Dr. Dukak provides technical support and advice to UNFPA country offices dealing with emergency situations in regards to sexual and reproductive health issues, gender-based violence, and gender during humanitarian crises and in post-conflict and recovery settings. Before joining the UN in June 2004, Dr. Dukak was the Director of Relief and Development Programs with the International Medical Corps. She managed and developed the technical aspect of service delivery programming to improve quality of care within IMC overseas programs in relief and development settings across Africa, Central Asia, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. Following Dr. Dukak, we'll have three presentations from corporate supporters of the Safe Birth Even Here campaign. Joy Marini is Executive Director of Global Community Impact for Johnson & Johnson, a position she assumed in 2007 following six years with the Johnson & Johnson Pediatric Institute. Joy leads the company's global public health and development team focused on improving health for women, children, and adolescents. Joy was actively engaged in the company's commitment to every woman, every child that reached over 400 million women and children. She now heads the Johnson & Johnson five-year commitment to the Every Newborn Action Plan and the Johnson & Johnson Citizenship and Sustainability Commitment, which will improve skills and knowledge of birth attendants and mothers in 20 countries. Joy has co-developed or led public public-private partnerships, including Born on Time, Survive and Thrive, and the China Neonatal Resuscitation Program, which is now in its 11th year. Gisela Abum is the Global Executive Director for Government Affairs and Policy for GE Healthcare. She works in collaboration with the World Health Organization, UN, World Bank, and governments globally to improve health outcomes. Gisela has written over 40 ministerial briefings on various policy issues, including health reform. She is currently the chair of the Global Diagnostic Imaging, Healthcare IT, and Radiation Therapy Trade Association, WHO Working Group. Gisela joined GE in 2007 after 13 years of working in the National Health Service and local government in the United Kingdom. She was one of the leadership team that set up the Center for Public Health Excellence at the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. Sonia Shao is the president of Zonta International and Zonta International Foundation. Zonta's mission is to empower women worldwide through service and advocacy. Sonia worked for 25 years as a Nordic Human Resources Director for Bearsdorf, a subsidiary of an international consumer goods company. She has also worked as a senior business consultant for IFS Scandinavia, where her responsibilities were to implement information technology support within human resources for customers based in Scandinavia, but with subsidiaries all over the globe. And with that, I turn the mic over to Dr. Dukak to provide us with an overview of the impact of humanitarian crises on maternal health and more on the Safe Birth Even Here campaign. Dr. Dukak? Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for giving us the, this opportunity. Uh, I want to say that uh, for, you, for UNFPA, I think the humanitarian imperative is very important. And uh, for us, is um, we 
based on our mission uh, statement, um, delivering a world where every pregnancy is wanted, every childbirth is safe, and every young person potentials uh, is fulfilled, even during emergencies. And that's one, one thing that we also wanted to, to stress, although people see the mission and then they don't see emergencies, but it is for us. It's everywhere in the world that this is, needs to be done and it needs to be uh, implemented so that we make every pregnancy wanted and every childbirth is safe. And of course, yeah, every young person's potential is fulfilled. Uh, for UNFPA, humanitarian priorities are, are, uh, are very important. Um, uh, one, one, the first one is uh, facilitate and support universal access to sexual and reproductive health and reproductive rights, uh, re prevent uh, and respond to gender-based violence, provide services to survivors of sexual violence and other forms of gender-based violence, engage and meet the needs of adolescents and young people, and support uh, quality data in emergencies. Because without data, we will not be able to plan or, or know what, how much we need to, to provide the, the needed support for the affected population. So let me go to, like, uh, to the next slide where I, I just wanted to show you the, the, global, um, uh, the global forecast. Uh, and, and basically, this is, a, like a, this is a, a global forecast that measures um, a, a fragile context and uh, a fra fragile state uh, index by the, by the Peace Fund. And they have looked at, at uh, how many uh, countries and where you see the red and the hunt, like, like where you see a lot of red and orange, it's basically these are countries that are like they, they will be affected by either emergencies or by conflicts or by natural disasters. So these are the countries that we really need to look at and make sure that we address their vulnerability because they are more prone and vulnerable. <coughs> Sorry, my voice is going a little bit bad, but I think these are the countries that we always have to really be on the look for and, and really address their needs. I can also give you another, uh, the next slides where we are looking, for example, where we had natural disasters. And, and that, therefore, you need data uh, to know how, how much support you need to provide. So for example, we did provide support for Sierra Leone. Uh, so we estimated 123,000 uh, women were pregnant uh, in Ebola affected Sierra Leone in 2015 and, uh, and 14. In Nepal, the same thing, you know, like uh, we estimated how many women are pregnant and need uh, support, uh, emergency obstetric uh, care in, in the coming months. And we have to really recognize or the Philippines or Vanuatu, these are places where women do not stop getting pregnant or having babies when a crisis hits. If it's a natural disaster or a conflict, women will still have to deliver and they have to deliver safely as much as possible in order to really minimize uh, their deaths from uh, not being able to, to uh, get medical care in a timely manner, or they will not get you know, uh, assistance in a timely manner because of the situation. So one of the things that we needed to really look at, and, and this is why you know, I have a few slides to really give you an understanding that women and girls are disproportionately disadvantaged we know that more than 100 million uh, people in need of humanitarian assistance. Uh, one quarter are going to be women and girls ages between 14, 15 to 49 years. And they are always at heightened risk of sexually transmitted infection, including HIV, AIDS, uh, unintended unwanted pregnancies, maternal death and illnesses, and sexual and gender-based violence. And I go back to un, uh, unintended, unwanted pregnancy. Again, if we look at a complex situation or if we look at a natural situation, natural disaster situation, what will happen is there is a disruption of like um, uh, the supply chain. And when the supply chain is disrupted, uh, women might not even get the contraceptives that they are used to take. So therefore, you know, I mean, they might 
have unintended pregnancies that basically will uh, limit their ability to be able to care for these children uh, if they got, you know, like uh, uh, pregnant. So these are some of the, the risks that are involved. Of course, in, in we have seen more and more um, that um, uh, rape is being utilized as a weapon of war in many settings. Uh, and um, as we all know, you know, we have seen that in Iraq, we have seen that in Syria, we have seen that in Bosnia, we have seen that in, in Rwanda. So we have seen uh, uh, sexual violence being utilized as a weapon of, of war. Um, again, you know, definitely conflict impacts uh, women and men differently. And I have two slides afterwards just to show the direct and indirect uh, impact on men and then the direct and indirect uh, impact on, on women. So you can like pass that because I want others also to talk and then we want to have questions and answer if people want to talk about things. The, the, the slide afterwards is, is that displacement in the 21st century has, has been increasing. We have seen an increase in internal displaced uh, persons. We have seen an, a, 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 an increase in refugees and asylum seekers. We have, uh, uh, we have seen that uh, people who are newly being displaced uh, during the years, so we have seen an increase. If you look at um, the orange line, you will see that in 2014, we started hitting in 2014 and 15, we are starting to hit a very high this is the highest since uh, uh, World War II. So this is just gives you an understanding that uh, the, the situation is not improving in the world and that, that there is a need to be really prepared and really uh, support uh, uh, women and girls in these type of settings. And we, can, we also see that the average time as, uh, to, to being in a refugee camp, in a refugee situation, not only a refugee camp, because we know more and more uh, uh, people are being displaced now in urban settings and not only in camp. But the average is 20 years. You know, like it's uh, like maybe a few years ago it was uh, 15. Uh, uh, afterwards it became 17, and now the average is almost 20 years. This is just a slide to show you the duration. So if imagine if a child is born during that period. They, they are now around 20 years old by the time, you know what I mean, they, they have like some sort of solution is being sought for them. So, and again, you know what I mean, like sometimes people say, oh, but you know, there are more men that being, you know, uh, die directly from, from the war or the conflict. Yes, but the reality of the matter also women are more likely to die uh, or be harmed by indirect causes uh, after a conflict. And we have seen that in many places uh, around the world where because of lack of services, because there is no uh, supplies coming to them, you know, women and girls do die because of things that we can prevent. And we can prevent if we get the resources uh, and the supplies and the services to them in time and they have the information to be able to, do, uh, to, to, uh, to access services. And again, uh, I agree, you know what I mean, that, that we need to really uh, have an essential package and action and services from the onset of a crisis. And, and for us, you know, it's very important priority services should be emergency obstetric care and newborn care. We need to have referral system for obstetric emergencies. We have to have supplies for clean and safe deliveries. We have to have contraceptions, condoms, antiretroviral, clinical rape like clinical care for survivors of rape. And the objectives of all of that is really to prevent the maternal and infant mortality, to reduce transmission of HIV, and to prevent and manage consequences of sexual violence and gender-based violence. If you look at the next slide, just to give you an, an example from 2015, for UNFPA, we have been able to uh, to provide uh, uh, supplies, emergency reproductive health uh, kits to, to many countries, and we have been able to reach 43 countries in 2015. We actually, uh, we have more than 1 million beneficiaries uh, of sexual and reproductive health services. 
So, and I, you know, I have given you like by, by, uh, by region, so the Asia Pacific region, the uh, Arab state regional, uh, uh, where we have been working with countries um, in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, in, uh, in East and Southern Africa region, uh, West and, uh, and Central African region, and Latin America uh, and, and the Caribbean. If you look at the next slide, what we have been able to achieve in 2016, because again, you know what I mean, why we are saying uh, 2016 is important, you can see that we have been able to really uh, 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 provide services like such as maternity uh, homes, maternity uh, tents, uh, in 15 countries, we were able to actually reach, we targeted around um, almost uh, 11, uh, 11 million people in, uh, in sexual and reproductive health services and, and GBV services in 53 countries. So you have to see that there, there is an increase on that. Just next slide, if you, if you go on that, just I, get, I wanted to show you, um, uh, like when you have a good program, what happens? You know, like in Zatari, we were able to have five, more than 5,000 safe deliveries happening in, in the camp with no one death of maternal death. So that's where, why we want to have this campaign. Safe birth even here is, is a campaign that UNFPA with some of our corporate partners have been able to put together. Uh, it's a campaign to raise support for pregnant women in emergencies. And um, as, as our, uh, uh, in our production, uh, in introduction, we have said safe birth even here is because we know that three in five maternal deaths occur in humanitarian and fragile contexts, uh, that the majority of people who are displaced are women and girls uh, and, and children. And, uh, you know, when disaster strike, strikes, Women and, uh, are at high risk due to loss of medical support compounded by trauma, malnutrition, and exposure to violence. And we see now with El Nino uh, a, a phenomena now, we see more and more also uh, women are affected by food insecurity. Um, and again, you know, UNFPA works with, with all our partners to ensure that safe deliveries also are happening during crisis, like setting up mobile clinics, training midwives uh, and other frontline health workers, protecting women's health, safety and dignity, and delivering life-saving health supplies, equipment, med medicines, such as emergency reproductive health kits, but we also provide dignity kits, which has also supplies for women who are affected by that. So let me talk about uh, the campaign. We have uh, several building blocks of the campaign, a communication block, an advocacy block, and a fundraising block. Um, and we had been able to really launch the, the campaign during uh, uh, milestones like uh, uh, the World Humanitarian Summit in Istanbul in May this year. We were able to do the Global Compact Leaders uh, Summit in New York 22nd and 23rd of June, and in, well, in 19th of September, we had the UN Summit on Refugee and Migrants in New York. And uh, so the Safe Birth Even Here campaign is, has been, you know, uh, supported by some of our uh, partners like uh, uh, United Colors of Benetton, Byers, uh, uh, General Electric, Johnson & Johnson, and Zonta uh, International, and Google. So I will stop here and give the opportunity for other of uh, the colleagues who are our supporters to talk about it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Dukak. Um And turning it over to Joy Marini from, from Johnson & Johnson. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. I really, uh, really appreciated that overview, and I'm, I'm so pleased to be here. It's, it's actually quite awesome to be able to sit in your own office <laughs> and participate, and, um, and also, uh, you know, just really proud to be here as a, a longtime partner of UNFPA and also serving on the board of GBC Health. So, um, 
I'm here to talk a little bit about a private sector perspective. So we heard we heard what the situation is, and so how can the private sector think about working in fragile states? So would you go to the next slide? I want to back us up a little bit and um, talk about the MDGs and the SDGs. Um, you know, Johnson & Johnson had a commitment to the MDGs, uh, which we fulfilled, and now in the era of the Sustainable Development Goals, um, we needed to rethink our commitment. The goals are much, much uh, more comprehensive. Um, the goals really include um, all countries. Uh, whether you are in the very most difficult countries to work in with uh, very little infrastructure or whether you are in uh, a very developed country that um, has very low maternal and newborn mortality. And, but, but making an SDG promise, and you can see here um, what our commitment was, and I will just mention that these are five-year targets, in surgery, women and children's health, health workforce, environmental health, and global disease. And you can see the overlay of partnership, health, and, um, and uh, um, gender uh, MDGs, I mean SDGs 3, 5, and 17. And, but what happened with the SDGs, or what we're thinking about now, is we have to think about every, every place in the world. We can't, we cannot, with if making an SDG promise, think about only working in the areas that are easy to work in. We have to take on some of the toughest challenges, um, both ends of the spectrum, uh, if we are going to um, have an SDG commitment. Can you look at, can we go to the next slide? So here's the reality. Um, you know, what is a fragile state? We were just, we just had a really great overview of the fragile states. Um, and, and basically it's, you know, the nation is unable to provide basic services to its population. And there are many, many dimensions. This was uh, OECD's um, uh, identified dimensions. I think we could probably think of others. And you can click again. Um, the reality is that the, that the majority of the poorest populations are in fragile and conflict-affected states, and most of those populations are made up of youth. This is really our future that we're talking about. Um, by, by 2030, some estimates are as high as two-thirds, an alarming two-thirds um, of the extreme poor will be in fragile states. Uh, next. So we talked a lot about uh, in the previous um, in the previous presentation about maternal, newborn, and child health challenges. So I'm not going to really go into those in detail. I think the one thing to take away from that um, is that is, is the message that we heard previously that women um, people are filled with hope at all times, and they will continue to, to become pregnant. They will continue to have children and raise families in every context. And so to have um, the most important and beautiful moments of your life happen in very dangerous uh, conditions is really you know, not our hope for women and children or for the world. So can we move forward? So the private sector does have a role to play here. You can look in the green. Um, this is, uh, look at the green on the graph on the right. This is really um, uh, funding global MNCH, Maternal, Newborn, and Child Health Assistance, and click again. Uh, did you click, did you go to the next one? One was maternal and this is newborn and child. I can't tell if you clicked. It was sorry, it was difficult. But you know, the private sector has an opportunity to bring in resources, expertise, advocacy, visibility. Um, the private sector does have uh, does tend to take risks. Um, they're creative. They will adapt. Um, I shouldn't say we. I should they, they. I should say we. And um, sometimes we have the ability to deliver services faster or or uh, at a very at a better quality standards. Next slide. So here's where the rubber meets the road. 
why don't we? Why don't we invest in maternal and child health in fragile and conflict-affected states? Well, here was the big one. I presented this to a group of business leaders um, a few weeks ago, and the, the biggest constraint, the first thing I heard was, well, we don't have a current business interest there. And so we're really not going to do um, our citizenship, nor are we going to do, um, nor, nor are we able to really take the risk to, to start uh, doing business. Higher rate of failure, there's a hot, huge perception of risk. Um, rapidly changing conditions um, encourage very short timelines. And when you're, when you're in the private sector and you're working in, in um, development, we think a lot about scale and sustainability. Scale and sustainability. I'm sure many of you listening in today have either used those words or heard those words many times. And it becomes a little more challenging in fragile states. Um, so when we invest, uh, we have to think about our investments maybe with a different lens. Um, can you click again? So maybe we need to consider an alternate rationale for engagement. Um, thinking, for instance, as I mentioned about the SDGs. Where are we going to do our work? If we have an SDG commitment, and many of those on the phone, I recognize some of you have made an SDG commitment. Um, maybe we think about balancing our portfolios to accommodate fragile states. So. Um, maybe there's a small percentage uh, of the portfolio that is invested in fragile states over a long term, and you can think about um, looking into the, the challenges and the benefits. Um, aligning with the local priorities. This is going to be important for, um, for scale and for sustainability. Um, tailor your models. We can't do the same things in fragile states necessarily that we're doing in, um, in more stable environments. Um, partnering to reduce risk with local partners who understand the environment and who will be there long after we're gone, and increasing your timelines. Um, it may take longer to, um, to get your program started. It may, uh, you need longer timelines for metrics. <clears throat> I think one of the things to think about is is how not only how how what and how are we going to do this and how are we going to view fragile states and I wanted to um, tell a little story about I was having dinner and it was literally just within the last couple of months with um, a friend of mine who is from Liberia and still lives in Liberia actually for m much of his time and. We were talking about fragile states, and, and about halfway through the conversation, he said, you know, I know that this is the word that we use for countries that are in this kind of a context, but that's not the way I see myself, and that's not the way I see my country. And that really stopped me in my tracks and made me think about how we view fragile states. And I think we... So I came up with a new acronym for FCAS instead of Fragile and Conflict Affected States. I think we need to think about fulfilled communities achieve success. There may not be business there, but this is the future. We talked about earlier about how many youth are in fragile and conflict affected states. Um, this is where our future is, and if we don't get this right, we are never going to reach our sustainable development goals. So in short, when you look at that arrow of some, some thoughts about how the private sector could work, um, in order to have fulfilled communities who can achieve success, we need programs that are going to be providing direct services, number one. Number two, we need to work with and empower communities. Number three, we need to build local capacity over the long term. Next slide. So I'm not going to go into really deep detail about the work that J&J &J does. I will say that we have worked in about a third of the countries that are deemed fragile. Um, and I, and I, you know, the, that list changes, and it changes depending on who is uh, identifying the countries. But, but we could say about a third of those countries we have worked in at some point. Um, our most recent, uh, this is actually 2016 only. 
and our most recent work is with is getting started with Safe Birth Even Here. We've been very proud. We hope that others joining will join this campaign, but I think there are two ways to, to engage. We can join the campaign, and that's great. We're raising the visibility of uh, mothers and children and, and adolescents in in these spaces, but I think we wa we really wanted to kind of put our you know, really walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So we actually are um, engaged in some on-the-ground work. It's just getting launched. It actually hasn't even been completely announced at this point in both Haiti and Liberia. And uh, in Liberia, we're looking at community health assistance, helping to um, uh, refurbish maternity homes, uh, trying to get more women to give birth with a skilled birth attendant or in a facility. In Haiti, uh, our focus is girl spaces and maternity clinics, so we really want to have some um, girl-friendly services um, and even including some Zika prevention as well as, of course, working on uh, building healthcare capacity. I think one of the things we talked about, you know, what risk and and why it's difficult for the private sector. So as you can imagine, we we decided to partner in these two countries and within, I think it was maybe a week, Hurricane Matthew hit. And suddenly our, our objective of building um, services in Haiti uh, became a little bit of a backseat of what was happening, in, happening for immediate need. And this is kind of a reality in some of these spaces. They are very um, uh, very susceptible to whatever is causing them to be deemed fragile, either conflict, disaster, natural disaster, and, and, they, and there's a very huge difficulty with resiliency. But um, we, we are still forging on. We're, we are looked at some immediate... Uh, things that we could do in the immediate short term, and we are still looking at the. We're look. We're here for the long game. We're looking for the long game, and really want to improve the services for all women and children. Um, Syrian refugee crisis. We have a commitment with the White House. Uh, humanitarian relief. Uh, that is a, a long time platform, and I think. Below uh, in the Zika response is just an example of how we brought our businesses in um, to really work on some health worker training models for Zika in Brazil. So I'm just mentioning those as other examples. Next slide. So um, with that, I thank you for uh, including me, and I hope that you join us in Safe Birth Even Here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Joy. Um, Gisela, your line's been been unmuted. Okay. Hello. Hi, we can hear you. Can you speak up just a little bit louder, though? Good. Hello. So good morning and good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are. I'm based in UK at the moment. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to all of you about the Safe Breath Even Here campaign. So G Healthcare, um, I've been working here in SPA for a while now. Um, we started off by signing a partnership with UNFPA to support a platform for midwives to train them on different areas in terms of education and training. And it was focused on young midwives under the age of 35 and just seeing their enthusiasm, the interest from the different midwives, sharing their stories and what they're going through in different parts of the world for us was really interesting and very enlightening for us to be able to work closely with UNFPA. So that really sparked our interest in wanting to support the Safe Birth Even Here campaign. The next slide, please. So this is a slide, obviously, you can see I've taken from UNFPA. Um, it speaks for itself. I think both J&J &J and UNFPA have made the case that it's really important that we don't just look at, you know, where it's easy for mothers, women, and children, 
you know, to have access to health care, but we need to look at it from a global scale. And that's where people are displaced, where there are different disasters, that we all come together to collaborate, to really support the women, children, and girls. And as again, it's been explained that three in five maternal deaths occur in humanitarian and fragile contexts. And that's something that we can't ignore at all. G Healthcare operates in over 130 countries. Some of them are the fragile countries as well. So we feel that it's important to join forces with UNFP and the partners to really see that we can make a difference by improving survival rates for mothers and babies, by making sure they are safe and they have safe deliveries as well. Okay, next slide, please. So this slide is what I call health imagination. So in 2009, GE Healthcare, we launched an initiative called Health Imagination. And really was, it was a six billion challenge, which we said we would, in, by 2015, actually develop 100 new technologies, improving access, improving care, and then obviously reducing the cost, but maintaining quality. And this was really focused on helping different countries improve access to healthcare. And one big element of it was maternal, newborn, and child health. So we focused a lot on saying that how could we increase access in the areas where people don't have access? So going into partnerships with different organizations, developing basic technologies that would be either battery operated, be used through solar energy, just to make it easier in terms of access. And then we spent a lot of time in education and training, working with midwives, seeing how we could help them through tax shifting. So they've been empowered in the communities, especially where they don't have doctors, to be able to manage the whole maternal, newborn, and child care pathway. So that's been a big focus for us as a company, that how can we improve access to health care for mothers, you know, for even babies, because a lot of babies die um, because of the different complications of birth as well. So that's been our big focus over the years, in, especially in Africa, Asia, um, in India as well, and Latin America being the regions that we focused a lot of our efforts on working with different partners and as well as the government. And so working on this um, initiative for me really falls in place in terms of where we want to go as a company, really doing more and increasing access to healthcare, making it more affordable, more sustainable, and obviously moving from the MDGs to the SDGs, this makes it really important. Next slide, please. So, also waiting for the next slide. I think to say it's important, um, last year at the UN General Assembly, um, GE Healthcare launched a new sustainable healthcare solution. And this was with our new CEO who said, look, what more can we do to really improve access to healthcare? And we did some work and analysis and looked at reports by the World Bank, which said that 5.8 billion people still do not have enough access to healthcare. And this is across the whole world. So we said, what can we do? Obviously invest in developing new and affordable technologies, but importantly, build partnership with those who are working on the ground, like organizations like UNFPA, build um, you know, education and training centers where we could do more capacity building. So we've done a lot in terms of in India, for example, where we're working with the different states and we've made a commitment to help train um, healthcare workers, about 100,000 of them over the next five to 10 years. So we feel that by partnering, by helping in terms of the capacity building, getting people you know, up to speed in terms of what they need to do for the different areas in terms of access to health will help 
in terms of improving access, the identification of risk across what we do in she healthcare, big element of where we focus on is on diagnosis. So we feel that in every care pathway, without diagnosis, you can't get proper effective treatment. So we focus on other, what is the problem? What is causing a mother to have a complication? How can she get better access? How can we make sure the baby is safe? What are the number of scans the mother should have, especially if the mother is at risk? So those are where our expertise and strengths are. And then we spend a lot of time, as I said, working with people in terms of education and training. We have a GE Foundation who is really good in terms of responding responding to different crises as well. So, for example, the Ebola crisis that happened in Africa, apart from donating a lot of money, we also helped in terms of giving, providing oxygen in hospitals and working with different partners in terms of access to different technologies. With Zika as well, we've also been, we've also donated some funds and working more closely on the ground to see how we can get better access to the technologies and the diagnosis that is needed as well. Next slide, please. And I'm sorry for the background noise. So this was saying that in terms of uh, sustainable healthcare solutions, this is what we said that 80% of the world's healthcare spend is spent on just 20% of the world's population. So to the point that's been made by the other speakers. So there's still not enough access to healthcare. There's still not enough funds, you know, to go around to those who need it the most. So those in fragile states and in humanitarian crisis really do not have the resources to really get the access to healthcare that is needed. And so collaborating with the NGOs, with the private sector, people like us that we already have the facilities and infrastructure in some of those countries is really key to improve survival rates for mothers, children, and babies. And I think we need to do more of these kinds of collaborations to really ensure sustainability. I mean, when the sustainable development goals were signed, everyone said it was quite long, but it's really focused on all the aspects that really are integral. Because if we just even focus on the health sector or just looking at health, it's not enough. We need an education, we need an infrastructure, we need um, better roads because, you know, so it's the whole infrastructure is required to really enable this. Next slide, please. So this is just quickly, just a quick snapshot of really the care pathway and just showing where G Healthcare really plays in terms of our technologies and solutions. So as I said, we spend a lot of time looking at the whole care pathway and how we can work in partnership. And for this particular campaign, Safe Beth even here, it's so relevant that how can we ensure that mothers have access to healthcare in these settings? What more can we do in terms of either building even some makeshift facilities, having better care, having more volunteers and workers coming together, you know, to actually identify and build the capacity in the different areas. It's only by working together, I think, that this can be achieved. And I think it's really important that, um, you know, when we spend time looking at where next, you know, we need to make an impact, especially through our G Foundation. It's important that we look at these fragile states and say, what can we do to make it more safe, you know, for the mothers, children, and babies? I think that is so critical. Next slide, please. So just to, fin just to finally um, end, I would just say that partnerships are critical, and I think we've all said it for implementation and sustainability. GE Healthcare is new to this partnership, as you can tell, but we are really enthusiastic about it, that we want to work more closely with all of you to make a difference, because we really do feel every mother 
deserves a chance to survive. And just by us investing in time and effort and our resources and even awareness, this will help mothers to be saved and make a difference. Where I come from, I come from Africa, and we say that if you train a mother, you invest in a woman, you train a nation. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. And I look forward to us working together. And those who haven't signed up yet, please do sign up because together we can make a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gisela. Um, and moving on to our final presentation. Um, if Sonia, if you're on, still on the call. Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me to this webinar and to be a supporter of the Safe Births Every Way campaign. I want to talk to you about two practical examples of activities where Santa is involved as an organization to create safe births. I will talk about birthing kits and I will talk about the Liberia FISTRA project, a project where we cooperate with UNFPA. I had the privilege to visit Liberia in 2014 and with my own eyes see what was happening. Coming from calm Sweden, it was a really eye-opener. But first, some quick words about SONTA. Next slide. Our organization was founded in 1919 in Buffalo, US. We have 30,000 members in 66 countries. We have consultative status. I think you lost the picture. We have consultative status with ECOSOC and UNESCO. We have participatory stories as a status with Council of Europe, and our mission is, as you heard before, empowering women through service and advocacy. And we are strong supporters of goal number three, four, and five. Next slide. This is a dream for every mother, a newborn baby sleeping quietly in a comfortable and cozy bed. But this is not a reality for everyone, as we know, and we have heard from our previous speakers. Next slide. Our Santa clubs in Australia and also in some of our districts in North America pack birthing kits. These are distributed to women due to isolation or poor transports have little or no assistance during childbirth, often giving birth at home. By providing a clean birthing kit, these mothers have resources to reduce infection both for themselves and the babies. The kits are distributed with a number of partners that are carefully screened to comply with the condi conditions that ensure accountability. In the receiving countries, the kits are distributed with the assistance of health professionals who gives instruction on how to use the kits correctly and dispose of the waste safely. The kits consist of a sheet of plastic, gauze, string, a blade, soap and gloves. Over 1 million birthing kits have been sent overseas only from Australia so far. When our members, and I should say also other interested persons, meet to assemble the kits, they not only assemble kits, they also build friendships and networks. So it's a real win-win situation for all, both the women who benefit from the kits as well as the one packing them. And now I would like to continue with our international service project in Liberia. Next slide. The global campaign to end fistula launched in 2003 by UN. UNFPA and partners, and Santa International has been a major funder since 2008. We have focused our activities in Liberia, and we have so far contributed with 2006 million US dollars, and we will add another 1 million during the period 2016 to 2018. Our funds comes more or less 100% from our members donating money. They either make donations themselves or arrange fundraisers. Having said that, it is important that we know where the money ends up. Our members demand that, that, and that is why we choose one country, Liberia, as it's easier to follow up. Next slide. <clears throat> In 87% of all cases of obstetric fistula is caused by prolonged labor without medical care. As the mothers live far from a hospital and the roads in this country is a challenge. The baby is usually stillborn and the mother suffers from chronic incontinence. Still, the pain and discomfort are easier to overcome than the stigma and humiliation attached to their condition. As a woman, it's easy to understand the trauma that your baby dies after several days of labor 
and that you yourself get the condition where you are banned by your family and friends. This is why our members so easily have adopted this project. It is a woman's issue that in most cases can be treated. It is a condition that does not exist in any part, in many parts of the world, and it is unknown. Next, next slide. The project stands on four pillars, prevent, treat, rehabilitate, and support. Prevention is, as I see, the crucial thing to do. And they are working with massive awareness campaigns helped by journalists that have been trained. They also train fistula survivors to be ambassadors, and meetings are arranged in schools, in marketplaces, and everywhere else where people are meeting. Health workers are also trained to identify fistula cases early. Fistula care is now integrated in training curriculum for doctors and nurses, and the state has placed midwives in all counties to support the local birth attendants and transfer knowledge. To treat, more than 2,000 women have received operations so far, and many are on the waiting list. To rehabilitate, every woman who has been treated is offered to take part in trainings to be self-sufficient. They can learn to be hairdressers, to bake or sell bread or soap or to cook. Also, that they can have an income of their own and not be dependent on a husband or their families. They also have the possibility to learn how to read and write, and they get psychological and social coaching, something that is very important. And the last pillow, support. Some cases are not possible to operate, so in cases they get for other forms of suiting treatments and supplies. Next slide. So what is then my reflections? Every girl has the right to an education. She should also have access to quality sexual and reproductive health services, including family planning. But it is not only the girls and young women that needs training. It is also healthcare workers like midwives, nurses, and doctors. No girl should be forced into an early marriage. This put her in the risk of for early childbearing that her body is not ready for. And violence against women is also a pandemic that causes trauma for women, both in childbearing situations and others. We as civil society partners can support the safe birds everywhere to raising awareness about the issue in all our society. As an organization with 1200 clubs over the world, we have this possibility. We could assist with cooperation with governments as we are depending on their support to have sustainable pro projects. We must all work together, governments, local communities, United Nations and civil society to change the lives of women. Every woman has the right to a safe birth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia, for that uh, presentation. Um, thank you to all of our speakers for providing insights into their work with women and girls in fragile conflict areas and for providing such concrete examples of how their peers and the business community can engage in the space. Um, I know that we have come to um, time, so I wanted to just quickly turn it over to Nancy Wildfire Fields, president of GBC Health, um, for some quick closing remarks and a, and a call to action. Nancy, your line's open. Hi, thanks so much, Nisa. And I really want to extend a warm thanks to all of our speakers for the ideas about how we can get involved, how the private sector can be involved, of what the needs, of what the needs are, and for really sharing their insp inspirations for supporting the Safe Birth Even Here campaign. At GBC, we are supporting the Safe Birth Even Here, um, Even Here campaign and firmly believe that delivery should be safe regardless of the environment. And importantly, that women need to have access to both the tools and healthcare, which are so important to their self safety and well-being, particularly in some of these high-risk situations. Um, we've heard from our speakers a number of ways where and how companies can get involved um, in fragile and conflict um, conditions where it's not business as usual, where there's not the same structures and protocols in place, and there's a real need to be able to adapt models and strategies um, to respond to and align with natural um, with local priorities and to respond quickly with high-quality services. 
um, just a couple of points that, um, you know, that, that really had resonance with me. One is around the need to strengthen and ensure that supply chains stay open so that there is access to family planning, contraceptives, and tools, the need to ensure that um, the facilities remain open so that um, women have the adequate services to protect um, children, mothers, and babies in birth and, and follow up, the need within the SDGs to not just think about the areas where it's easy um, to, to continue to invest but take on some of those toughest challenges where we're focusing on some of the most vulnerable populations, but in in uh, but also within that um, investing in youth who really are our future and for mothers who are also um, really the future of society. Um, quickly, that the private sector has a, a number of ways that they can really engage within their overall core competencies of expertise. But again, some of the some of the ability for them to take on some of the programmatic and financial risks and the creativity to deliver in unusual situations, um, the need to think about how we can jointly bridge the fi the financial gap and help um, help governments within these fragile settings to ensure that the services are being delivered and the importance of partnerships and collaboration to ensure sustainability. Uh, in order to ensure sustainability of these programs and services moving forward. So for me, the call to action is really about um, joining uh, in the Support the Safe Birth Even Here pledge. And if I can read it briefly, I believe that all women and girls have a right to safe pregnancy and birth. I am committed to the Safe Birth Even Here campaign and lend my voice to ensuring that all women in humanitarian and fragile situations have access to reproductive health care, including antenatal care, emergency obstetric care, and safe delivery services to reduce needless maternal deaths. I am joining a global, global movement by the private sector to advance maternal health for women living in areas affected by or prone to conflicts or natural disasters. And with that, to our audience, if you would like to be more engaged in this space, please don't hesitate to reach out to GBC Health or UNFPA to learn more about the campaign and how your organizations can contribute to improving safe, safe birth during all crises. Thank you.